podium, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great to see everybody again. Uh, I think if you recall, I was out this way visiting your group uh, ooh, eight months ago or so. So I don't know how often it is that a speaker comes back, you know, within a 12-month calendar period. But I am very, very happy to be back and uh, and to give you a little bit of updates on things that have been going on over those last several months that I've been running around the world. Uh, you know, I used to actually play for Globetrotters too. So that's one of my, that was my very last professional stop, and I turned out to be an actual globetrotter with all the international work that I'm doing here. Um, you know, some of the things I want to touch on just for five, ten minutes, and then open up the Q&A, and we can have some fun with all this. Uh, over the last six months, for sure, uh, some really great things have been happening as far as some of the work I've been doing overseas. Um, I've become a director, a director for what's got to be the world's longest name of a company I've ever heard, uh, in China. This is a foreign student exchange program. And so it's a big national program, and I'm one of the directors for the China Service Center for Friendship and Cooperation for Countries Studying Abroad Department. So that's a mouthful, and it actually takes a couple of lines of my business card to get that all in, and quite a few Chinese characters on the other side. So, you know, they just kind of go with these names and put it all together and just keep on saying, hey, that is what it is. But being a director for that program, I'm working with uh, a lot of schools over in China, um, high schools and universities, and for the Chinese folks, you know, uh, education has turned out to be the key to where they're going to go in life, for their children especially. And I mean, I wish we could have the same kind of emphasis on our kids and our education system, but you know, we're working on it. Um, and so for, for, the, for the folks over in China where, that we're working with, we go around to high schools and universities and we talk to them about studying abroad opportunities, especially here in the United States. China sent 200,000 students to the United States last year. Amazing, I know. High school, universities, all over the country. And that's up for about 20% from the year before. And they'll probably bump it up another 20% this coming year. So we send you know, thousands of students uh, all over the United States. And these students come in, they're super motivated, they're, they're high achievers, and they're low maintenance. So figure that combination. That's a nice student to have, right? And so they're all going to excel in the classrooms. Uh, the parents now are part of that nouveau rich or the new wealth in China that's able to afford overseas tuition, out-of-state tuition, get them into schools, plug them into different universities around the, the United States, and get these kids on their way. And for, for the Chinese kids and for the Chinese parents, this is part of that one child per family policy that's been in place for about 30 years. So the parents look at the kids and say, wow, yeah, that's my retirement program. <laughs> so I gotta make sure that they get a quality education. And you, know, you can imagine the pressure on the kids, right? So quality education, and then they're going to get a great job. And then, you know, when we get older as elderly parents, those kids in turn turn around and take care of us because uh, the social programs, especially for retirement in China, isn't quite what it is here in the United States. And so that's been one of the real fun things I've been working with. Uh, you know, for decades here in Puget Sound, that I've lived here, I've done a lot of work with our students throughout the public schools and universities and high schools. Uh, especially at risk kids and mentoring programs and reading programs. So I've done and I continue to do a lot of that kind of work. But the work that we're doing in China now, you know, when you walk into a classroom, uh, the kids come running up to you and they just say, where, where can I get more math? And, you know, where can I get more science? I want more technology. I want more engineering classes. This is high school. <laughs> you know, and, and they want to come to America to get these classes. And so it's really kind of exciting to be part of all that and fun to be with all that. Um, you know, some news up north, uh, we hear our Seattle Supersonics may be back on their way back to town, so hopefully we're keeping our fingers crossed that all that's going to come to play. Matter of fact, I had coffee yesterday with one of my uh, longtime favorite people and one of my old coaches, Lenny Wilkins, and so Lenny and I were talking about the Sonics and how it's, how, how it's all coming together. So we both, you know, feel that uh, David Stern is probably going to get KJ, the mayor of Tacoma, or mayor, the mayor of Sacramento, uh, one last 11th hour, you know, heave from the three-point line to try to save the team in Sacramento. If they can put together, and this is probably what it's going to take, 
uh, somebody with a billion dollars to come in and just put it on the table and say, here's the 525 million for the team, here's another 400 plus million for an arena. That might be the only way they can keep that team in Sacramento. So we think that's so far-fetched and far-flung that it's probably not going to happen, especially in the next 30 days. I mean, and this is the kind of numbers we're talking about in professional sports now, a billion dollars, you know, a package like that. So we think Chris Hansen, Steve Bomber, and his crew, who are all kind of working with indirectly, uh, will be able to pull that out and uh, hopefully, you know, when it goes in front of the NBA board of governors in the next uh, uh, 30 days or so, the NBA will grant uh, the opportunity for the NBA to come back to Seattle. And that team, again, will be named the Seattle Supersonics. Uh, they won't be really good if they come from Sacramento. <laughs> they won't be good there. So we're going to have to be patient. They won't be good for three or four years, probably. Uh, but at least we'll have a team back, and hopefully the new owners will invest nicely in the team to get quality talent on board and then get a real quality product on the floor. Uh, you know, I really enjoy getting out and talking to the various Rotary groups around town. I was, uh, you know, I, I, I hit quite a few of the different ones in the Puget Sound. Uh, like I said, this is my second time coming to Tacoma Sunrise. I actually used to be a Rotarian with Tacoma 8 uh, several years ago. And after maybe a four or five uh, year hiatus, uh, I'm thinking now of rejoining Rotary, but with a different international flair to it. I'm going to join the Beijing International Rotary Club in China. Okay? So that way, when I come back to visit your Rotary groups and Rotary Clubs, I'll be a true visitor from a, a far country, right? And uh, with an international flair of a Beijing Rotary Group. And so I'll be joining them when I return to China next month sometime, as I plan to be there for, you know, about eight or nine months a year, the next two or three or four years. This is my plan of all the stuff we're doing in China. Um, some of the things we're doing in China, also in addition to the student programs, is working with the NBA retired players. Um, you know, China is a vast, vast country. Can I see a show of hands? Anybody who's ever been to China? Oh, good, 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 okay. You guys got a taste and a touch of what we're talking about here. You know, it's a vast, vast, vast country, and I don't know how much you've gotten a chance to see. I'm, I'm, like I said, over the last couple of years, I've been there eight months a year. And I'm still just the tip of the iceberg of stuff that I'm doing. So it's going to take years and years to really get to know the country, get to know the people, get to know the culture. Um, I'm studying Chinese now, so you know, so every day I'm, I'm there with my programs and studying uh, for at least an hour a day and really trying to get uh, more and more proficient with them. But you know, China is really the land of the new opportunities for uh, sports especially and for basketball in particular and for NBA basketball even more in particular. Uh, the NBA estimates there's over 750 million basketball fans in China. I mean, just grasp that number. I mean, that's twice the population of the United States. And, and these are all folks who are just crazy about NBA basketball. They want hats and t-shirts and, and, and shoes and game tickets and photos with the guys. And you can imagine when you see a group of guys like about my size, you know, all of us walking around through China. And, and the crowds just start gathering around, the, the traffic screeches to a stop, the photos start coming out, the cameras all over the place, and, and we cause kind of such, such a commotion every time we walk around the streets in China. But, but everybody's really excited about it, really happy about it. And so over the last couple of years, I've been working with a lot of the retired NBA guys and getting them over to China for basketball camps and clinics, coaching opportunities, uh, exhibition games. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, no longer, it's no longer the LA Showtime. Remember those teams back in LA? This is like, this is like slow time now, when the guys are out playing. <laughs> so, all the guys are jogging up and down the court now and, and casting away three-point shots. But we got a lot of great players out there, uh, guys you probably remember from the 80s and 90s. Uh, some of the uh, fellows from the uh, uh, Chicago Bulls team uh, with uh, Scotty Pippen, and Horace Grant, uh, Dennis Rodman, uh, Mitch Richmond from Golden State, uh, a couple of our Sonic guys, uh, Gary Payton, Sean Kemp, Dale Ellis, they all come out to play. Clyde Drexler from down in Portland. So a lot of the great players from back in the day. So, you know, they're no longer playing above the rim, but they still
joking out in play and have fun, and the crowds go crazy about it. I mean, we, we play in front of crowds of 15, 20,000 people, and these are folks who are willing to pay a couple hundred bucks for a ticket. 200 USD for a basketball game. I, I don't get it. I don't get it. But, you know, you got to go where you got to go and make things happen for yourself and for other folks that you're working with. And China's where it's at for all of us right now. Um, and then, you know, last stop I want to touch on before we uh, open up Q&A is North Korea. North Korea. Now, let me ask that question. Anybody here been to North Korea? All right, so that's a whole different thing now. North Korea, I was there in November, just this past uh, several months ago, and now, of course, North Korea is making the news every single week, if not every couple of days, with some crazy thing or another happening. A lot of it is, you know, we have to kind of take a little bit with some grain of salt, because it's propaganda, it's, you know, saber rattling, it's attention grabbing stuff that's made up a lot by their media and made up by a lot by our media. So, you know, sometimes you have to kind of read between the lines a little bit. But, you know, we were there in North Korea, I went with a nonprofit humanitarian group from, based out of Arizona and also out of Atlanta, Georgia. And so they took about eight or nine of us over, uh, professionals. So I was representing professional basketball, professional sports. We took uh, attorneys with us, we took corporate guys, uh, we took humanitarian, nonprofit people. And so we got a chance to really sit down and talk with various com uh, committees and groups in North Korea. Um, all, of, all of the meetings were staffed with government officials. Uh, all the meetings were recorded and monitored. Uh, you know, they told us that even your hotel room is probably monitored. So <laughs> be careful what you're doing in your hotel room. Um, but you know, I didn't have a sense of fear or anxiety about anything that was going on because we went with a very reputable group who has been in and out of North Korea three or four times a year for the last 15 years. So they, they do this quite often. And so we felt we were in pretty good hands with all that going on. Uh, again, as in China, uh, the North Koreans are crazy about basketball. Uh, I went through and uh, got a chance to meet all the basketball officials and run the programs throughout the country of North Korea. They told us that they have 40 professional basketball teams in North Korea. 40. The NBA only has 30. <laughs> and so, you know, and so I, I got a chance to meet some of the uh, national team members and some of the professional teams. I mean, they, they pretty much snapped their finger and all of a sudden a couple teams drove up and they played in front of us and, you know, put on a nice performance for us and all that. Uh, now, I've got some photos and it's hard to get photos out of North Korea. But uh, I was able to get a few photos. Uh, sorry, I couldn't bring them with me today, but of, of me posing with their basketball teams. Now, you know, North Koreans aren't terribly tall like us NBA guys and American guys are. So their tallest guy is probably like about 6'3, 6'4. So this is on the national team. And so posing with all these guys, and, and I'm thinking, wow, I'm in North Korea. This, this is. This is like otherworldly. Uh, now I'm having a second thought, I hope I can get out of North Korea. <laughs> because, uh, they're all looking at me like, wow, you know, we want something like that one. And I'm trying to say, <laughs> I, I was hoping they didn't, you know, put me out too uh, and keep me behind there uh, for other purposes. But uh, we were able to get a lot of things done with their basketball group and teams. We actually have a, an official invite to go back to North Korea sometime in April. And I was the only basketball guy this guy this time, but I'll be taking with me probably four or five uh, uh, former NBA players with us, and we'll go back to North Korea and do some basketball training and camps and clinics and things like that. So, so there are some good things happening with North Korea. Um, it is a little disturbing to hear that they put together a video and they're showing that around the world now, and they're talking about our, the sworn enemy of the United States and. And I know we have a lot of veterans here from the various, uh, you know, encounters throughout the years, and you know, we respect all of that. So uh, we're going solely on a humanitarian and a international relationship building kind of endeavor. So that's kind of where we are with North Korea. But um, going in now, they tell you 
no laptops, no computers, no smartphones, uh, no GPS devices. I had trouble getting my Kindle e-reader in. You know, they took the back off of it, and I'm like, you're going to break it. And, uh, they opened it up, they wanted to make sure there wasn't a GPS deal. And they give you, well, they'll let you take in a simple point-and-shoot camera. And they'll tell you where you can point and where you can shoot it. <laughs> I mean, this is North Korea right now. But, you know, a lot of my Chinese friends tell me, you know, that's China 40 years ago. That's kind of where China emerged from 40 years ago. And so we all kind of have some confidence that hopefully, uh, you know, relationships can continue to improve a little bit. Uh, the saber rattling calms down quite a bit, and we can actually start getting some diplomatic uh, relationships going with countries that we, and so this is all part of the global you know, democracy and diplomacy that we're all trying to work with. So anyway, those are some of the things that I've been working on over the last several months since I was here. I would like to open it up to Q&A for a few minutes. And, President Janet, if you can kind of monitor the talk for me and get me on stage when you're ready. Okay, and uh, let's go with the first question. You know, uh, you hear about poverty and hunger in North Korea, and uh, could you maybe talk a little bit about that in contrast to the South Korea? Well, you know, we didn't see, you know, any outward signs of poverty in North Korea. Uh, we went to Pyongyang, which is the capital city, about three million people there. Uh, now, it's Spartan conditions, big, huge government buildings, big, huge apartment complexes, 30, 40 stories high, beautiful modern city now, for the most part. Um, but you know, the government forbids people to just loiter around or to linger around and those kind of things. You know, you go to Tiananmen Square, there's hundreds of thousands of people just kind of side by side by side in the square. I have pictures of me in Pyongyang Square, and I'm the only person there. As far as I can see, you know, where is everybody? Three million people. So we went off the beaten path just a little bit. Uh, we actually played golf, uh, nine holes of golf at one of their three golf courses there in North Korea. Um, and again, the golf course was completely deserted, just our foursome. And we had a couple of caddies and uh, a golf carts that barely started up. We're building smoke out of the back. You know? So, you know, but this is kind of where it's at. But no, I didn't see, and, and we didn't see that kind of thing. And uh, you know, the experts I work with in North Korea say, yes, you know, it does exist to some extent, uh, poverty and famine and hunger, but that's, that's true in all third world countries uh, who are trying to make an upward stride. So they have a way to go. And, and I do believe their sincerity uh, when they say that they're working on their economy to try to rev it up a little bit to bring the people out of poverty more so. So I think they're pretty sincere with that. Yes, did you have a question also? Yes. Um, the NBA obviously has quite a few European players, very few Chinese players. I think they have one in their own Can we expect more Chinese players to? Uh, I think eventually. Uh, right now, the second uh, superstar Chinese player is Jeremy Lin, who's playing with the Houston Rockets. Now he's from <coughs> Yao Ming. Yeah, I was about. I have a photo of me and Yao Ming together. I was like, here, I'm Ming. <laughs> you know, he's seven six or so. Uh, Jeremy is about 6'6", six, six, maybe 6'3". Six, so, uh, but he's, he's a pretty good player for Houston Rockets. And uh, I do see basketball training and basketball camps going on in China. And this is what some of our retired NBA guys are working with. Where they have quite a few seven foot players. Uh, most of them are pretty slightly built, so they're not big NBA guys or NBA ready. But I think you'll start seeing more and more players coming from China who will, you know, play uh, at least some in the NBA. Uh, we'll see if the next superstar comes out of China or not, you know, anytime soon. Another question? Yes. You mentioned the uh, Chinese one child policy. Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff I've read suggests that because of the preference for male children, there's a real imbalance in male female ratios in China right. uh, for marriage and things like that. Do you see that same kind of imbalance in the students that are coming over here? And what are you doing with the female students? Yeah, yeah, well, we're doing quite a bit with female students. Yes, we do see about an equal 50 50 um, you know, opportunity for the boys and the girls to come across uh, to America to study. 
Uh, now, mainly because if that one child is a girl, well, same thing. Uh, the family is going to invest pretty much everything in her, make sure she's going to get a quality education. Uh, to go abroad to study is easier uh, than it is to stay in China for a girl to study, because most of the girls are going to be expected to, you know, go off and get married and start a family and things. But the new Chinese folks are starting to think, well, you know, she's got a career. Let's get her educated. Let's get her a career. She can go either stay in the States or come back here, you know, and those kind of things. The one child per family uh, effect is really starting to show, though, in the fact that there's about 120 boys for every 100, 100 girls uh, under the age of 30 now in China. 120 for 100. So that's a, that's, a, that's a skew that's not really working in favor of China. The common thought now is that the one child per family policy will probably be, be done away with or, or severely modified in the next five years. Yeah, yeah, so that's what most people are starting to think. The new leadership that took place in China in November uh, is thinking along those lines also. And it's because China's become an aging population. You know, one child per family, all those parents are getting older, not enough kids to keep things going, and so you have to get back to, you know, being productive. So <laughs> we'll see how that works for them. Mm -hmm. Yes? Do the vast majority of the hundreds of thousands of students that come here to get educated go back? Um, not necessarily. Uh, most of the young people now we're dealing with, high school, university, uh, they're going to come here for several years, go to high school, then they'll go to universities, and then they'll most likely start a career if they can get a job here in the States. And, and this is where the impact is going to be felt with some of our kids who aren't performing at a high level, uh, who aren't getting those science, math, technology, engineering degrees underneath their belts. Well, the kids from overseas are coming in and taking those jobs. And so that's what we're going to start seeing and facing. Uh, our kids are dropping out at almost 50% rate here in the state of Washington out of high school. Uh, that's unheard of in China. You know, you're going to graduate from high school. And if by all means necessary, you're going to go to college. See, this is a whole different emphasis. So most of those kids, I'd say 70, 80% of them will stay here in the States for several years after the university because they'll be, they'll be offered great jobs. How do get the visas well, the visas come, uh, it, it, they change from a student visa, which, which they have as long as they're in school, to a work visa, which they can get as soon as uh, they get an appointment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, do you see on the basketball pipeline, do you see uh, Chinese coming to the U.S. to go to college to play basketball as, and, and then maybe to the NBA? Uh, that's a possibility. That's something that uh, both sides of the equation really want. Uh, and so Chinese kids who are both good students and good athletes as far as basketball, you know, we can't even begin to talk football yet for the Chinese kids, but uh, basketball for sure. Yeah, that's something that I think you'll see more and more of. Uh, because one, they'll be great students. And uh, two, they'll be getting uh, their degrees out of those universities. And three, if they're good enough to play in the NBA, you know, I'm sure somebody will make a way for that to happen. I've got students I work with that, you know, they're not basketball players, they're students, but they want to go to basketball powerhouse universities. I mean, that's how crazy they are about basketball. So they want to go to, you know, to Georgetown or to Boston College or to Syracuse or, you know, UCLA and all these other great uh, powerhouse schools because they can be up close and personal in basketball. So it's just, it's just a crazy phenomenon that's going on and probably will last for several more years here. Do you want to mention your card? I will. Thank you, President. Let me get one more question, if you would, please. Right behind you. Yes. Uh, who, the, who's your sponsor, or who is, is the sponsoring <coughs> the organization? Where's the money coming from? Uh, You're talking about sports or all these things? Sports or students? Which one are you talking about? Pardon? Are you talking about sports programs or student programs? Yeah, the program that you're working on. Well, uh, with the students, this, this is all private pay. This is parents who are able to you know, in many cases, pay $20,000 per year per student at the high school level. So they, they kick out $20,000 cash. I mean, a lot of Chinese folks don't believe in credit cards and debt. So they're kicking out 20 grand cash per student per, per year here in the United States. And then that kicks up to, you know, could be double that for the university levels easily. Um, with the basketball programs, we work with a lot of sponsors who help put together sponsorship packages. 
and that enables us to take care of the expenses of bringing guys over, getting them paid also, sending them back home after, after you know, whatever they're doing there is done. So that's how that all works. Uh, I do want to take just a quick moment to mention, yes, I, I am a, uh, thank you, uh, President, uh, I am a published author of Standing Above the Crowd. This is an inspirational, motivational book. Um, it talks a lot about some of the things that I'm doing with basketball, with education, with, with teamwork, with leadership, with uh, you know, inspiring everybody to be better and do a little bit more of what they're doing. Uh, I'm working on uh, the second book to follow up after this one now, uh, and that will incorporate some of the international student programs I'm doing, some of the Korean and North Korea travels I've been doing, and a lot of the different experiences I've been uh, getting a chance to experience over the years. So, I do have a bag of books and a box of books available if anybody's interested. I'll personally autograph them for you all, and uh, they're for $20 a piece, if you don't mind, and uh, you can also get your own personal copies at standingabovethecrowd.com, which I'm the guy behind the website saying, sign them all off and ship them out every day, so <laughs> that, that's me too, doing that from there. So, either way, that works just great, and I really, really appreciate the questions, the time, the opportunity to come back and give you a little update on some of the great things that are going on. So thank you very much, everyone.